your business. How's it going, guys? Uh, so, yeah, my name is Dave. Um, I currently work on the VR and science team at Facebook. Um, we're halfway through the third day of Valleycon. I just want to maybe we can do a round of applause so it all the presenters so far. Kind of loud. So, first things first. I have an accent. So, uh, if you can't understand me, lean in, squint. Uh, this is not a good talk to multitask on, or we can just do uh, Twitter or something afterwards. Typing is a lot easier. Um, so, as I was trying to figure out what to talk about today, I was going through all my work and um, I noticed a pattern. Without really knowing it, I always have this beginner's mind in, uh, with my work, and that's really what has led me to this path. So, I want to talk to you guys a bit about how I landed in VR and where some things I learned along the way. So I hope you find this useful. A beginner's mind is a term used by Zen Buddhism that refers to having an openness, uh, attitude of openness and lack of preconceptions when studying a subject, even if it is an advanced subject. I spent the last 10 years designing digital and physical products and have always been attracted by the novelty of new challenges. So just let me just tell you a bit more about me. A few years ago, I worked at a small design agency focused on building mobile commerce sites. Through that agency, I designed sites for Seek Number, Mattel, HP, Lenovo, and a bunch more. There was a point where I could design a mobile site with my eyes closed. If you've designed one before, you kind of get the deal. You have a menu with three buttons and a stack layout. So that's when I knew I had to get out and find a new problem to solve. So I moved to LA to lead a small design agency, uh, a small design team in that agency, which had, was something that I felt completely unqualified for. Managing creative people is really hard, and we all know how much it sucks to have a really bad manager. So after a year of learning about management and how to lead creative people, I decided to venture a little north and move to San Francisco. Along with four other co-founders, we worked on a product called Automatic. Automatic is an adapter that can plug into your car, connect your phone via Bluetooth, and give you access to data about the way you drive and your car's health. It was my first time working at a startup, let alone in San Francisco. My first time designing for hardware, my first time designing a package, and my first time seeing that package in the Apple Store. Like King and I'm a huge Apple fanboy, so this is a very surreal for me. After launching Automatic and growing the team from 4 to about 40, I felt I had done my part and found myself predicting where the, world, where the product would go. I had always worked at small companies before, and I didn't have any idea what working at a big tech company would be like. So I joined Facebook to find out. I've been there for over two and a half years now. I've worked on business products, consumer products, and most recently spent a year in London building a remote product team from scratch. These were all great experiences, but they definitely didn't turn out the way I was expecting. In fact, that's what made them so awesome. I really believe that when you catch yourself knowing where some people end, it's time to do something else. And that's why I work at VR today. I think it's one of the most exciting design challenges of our time, and I have no idea where it will go. So, to illustrate this point, let's just imagine we are in France, and it's 1896. Maybe you're a young, handsome boy. Uh, <laughs> you and your friends go out to the cinema, and you experience something like this.
that are registering your hands and fingers in the world. So when designing for VR, we must be aware of the fragmentations in the systems and design an experience that gracefully moves up and down the stack of interactivity. So lastly, we have environments. This is something we typically haven't had to think about before. When using 2D interfaces, most people understand that they're interacting with a screen, be it in your hand or on the desk, and use a familiar input mechanic like a keyboard, a mouse, or even your fingers. However, in VR, we don't have screens. So we no longer have these limitations and need to provide context for the UI that's in front of you. So a few questions come up like, where am I? <laughs> where is the UI coming from? Where does it sit in the world? And why does it behave this way? <laughs> Ignoring these questions can take people away from the experience and lose the immersion. This is the first time we've had to think about these questions, and they open the door to many interesting design opportunities. So that's presence, which is comprised of interactions, avatars, and environments. Next up, we have agency. So agency is the element of choice that impacts the environment and experience. In order to feel part of the world, it's important to be able to affect it. So we've started to explore this with 360 Media on Facebook. You can now share a 360 photo or video and use your phone to explore it as if looking at a different world through a window. You can also choose to step into that world by using that VR headset. What used to be a format confined by a rectangle can now expand beyond, beyond it through simple and intuitive user interaction. And we're starting to see content creators use agency as a storytelling tool. By having users control the camera and choose where to look, we're empowering them with the ability to control their experience. This creates a stronger bond between the user and the content as they get more invested through interacting with it. This also enables everyone to create immersive content with a device they already own and develop a language to tell the immersive story. So that's why we think agency is so important. So lastly, we have comfort. So comfort plays a major role in every design decision in VR. You guys have probably seen this chart before. It tells you like, where, where it's uncomfortable to uh, tap things on your phone. You might have noticed how uncomfortable it is to tap the back button with, with one hand in that abomination of the phone we call the Echo 6 Plus. <laughs> well, in mobile, the, the consequence of that design decision is a couple of aching thumbs and a frustrated speaker on stage. However, when designing for VR, ignoring comfort can quickly lead to motion sickness. Now imagine being that designer that worked on the uh, placement of the back button for iOS and presenting your design in a review with your boss. And as a result of tapping that button, he ends up throwing up. <laughs> like motion sickness is real. Every designer I've seen that joins the VR space starts out by designing a UI that fills the entire field of view and animates wildly when you interact with it. Well, it turns out your brain has a really hard time understanding that you're sitting in a stationary world where everything else around you is moving. So we found that giving people a clear understanding of the sky and ground plane is necessary to avoid motion sickness. So you can do anything in VR, but only the things your brain can believe are true can be done without making someone sick. UI should build upon patterns we understand and strip them from their limitations in the real world while still grounding them into something we can understand. So Oculus released a comprehensive list of best practices, a starting point for designing in VR. To create a comfortable experience, we have to consider the user's field of view and distance from the UI. We have to be conservative with animations, and because everything in VR revolves around the user, both figuratively and literally, we recommend surrounding the user, the UI around the user, so everything feels at the same distance. These are important to keep in mind as we start exploring the space, but like every rule, they were meant to be broken. I'm excited to see what crazy new interactions we can come up with, with that, as we dive deeper into this field. So those are the three concepts I want to share with you today, presence, agency, and comfort. I think they're uniquely expressed in VR, and they're an opportunity for us to uh, explore those with a beginner's mind. I think that makes VR very exciting. So there are not many of us out there, but we're learning every day 
what is unique about this medium, its limitations, <coughs> and which behaviors we can port from the 2D design world. What worked once may not work again. That's why I think it's important to keep a beginner's mind as we approach design problems. Let it lead us to new and unexplored places waiting to be designed. Thank you.
There are a few industries that are no brainer for VR. Like whenever you use a 2D interface to create a 3D environment, that should be done in VR like immediately. So 3D modelers, architects, all these people that are creating 3D objects, that I think it will be the, the first kind of use, usable uh, chunk of it. There's the entertainment side, which you know, makes gaming really exciting, and makes uh, immersive media really exciting. Uh, and what does that do to storytelling? Like how how will like Alfonso Cuarón and how how who, will he make an immersive um, design experience? Um, so so that's where I, where I'm really excited about. Um, but I think <coughs> in the future, and not too distant future, it's going to uh, it's going to take all sorts of our lives. Uh, like teleconferencing would be super interesting in VR, right? Uh, and so on. There's it just there's no limit. Um, in designing for VR, are you also considering accessibility for people with disabilities? Yeah, yeah. yeah it, there's uh, much more qualified people to talk about that than me. Um, there was actually so Google I/O is happening right now, and they had a talk about that. It's super interesting. I think it's it's a, it's a huge consideration, um, and it's something we need to consider as we as this becomes more and more mainstream and less of a niche about gaming. So a lot of companies right now are working on ways to interact in VR with controllers or on your keyboard, but not many people are doing it from the viewer perspective. Um, my example was Valve right now is working on a way to broadcast Dota matches in a virtual reality view. Right. And you can't actually interact with them. I'm curious if you have any experience working from the viewer side rather than somebody who's actively making or creating stuff. Yeah, yeah I think that's where agency comes in. Uh, even as a viewer, you should have some sort of input into your experience, and that's what makes we are different from anything else, right? So far, 2D experiences are, you know, there's a director or someone behind the camera that tells you what you should be looking at and what the perspective should be. And even as a, as a viewer, you should be able to experience, to uh, impact that experience. Um, so in the case of, you know, uh, somebody streaming a video game, that I can imagine in the future having viewers affect the video game experience by the way they, they, they interact with it. Hey, uh, so I was going to ask, you had a, a wonderful slide where you kind of defined the rules for creating UI in VR. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak to uh, the, the differences uh, between um, testing and learning those rules in VR, because your point being about motion sickness is real, um, to test these things out, you actually have to wear the, you know what I mean, like, so uh, if you could just speak to how, like, you found those rules and uh, your limitations with testing that stuff. Totally, yeah. So the, the workflow is typically, you know, you dive into Unity or Unreal or something like that, and like I said, everyone that starts in thinks, why are there only rectangles in space? Let's make something that's like super immersive. That's the first thing I did. And sure enough, you spend like, a day for that, and by the end of the day, you're like, you can barely get up on your seat. Uh, so that's, uh, in terms of workflow, it's, it's Coding, put your headset, signing coding, put your headset, um, and and I think it becomes very obvious those those rules like the distance from from your uh, like the distance you I should be the the curve UI all these things become very obvious and it they're just not obvious in the hypothetical but as soon as you start uh, experiencing it it's uh, it's kind of the, the starting point. I have a question. Um, I got my kids the uh, ViewMaster VR, uh, the Google Cardboard little headset thing. Yeah. And it's super cool. It was my first VR experience, their first VR experience. They all, every single one of them fell down as soon as they put it on. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, my, it's, I just want to get your thoughts on the like social aspects. So not necessarily like, hey, I'm going to jump in VR and I'm going to communicate with people not near me. Um, but like when when I put the VR heads on one of them and holding their face, like the other kid's like, it's my turn, it's my turn, it's my turn, like the whole time. And the kid, meanwhile, it's so immersive, like it's like been like you know 60 seconds, and they feel like it's been two seconds, you know, and they just want to have it longer. So like there's that. So the I don't know. It's, it seems like it'd be. What are your thoughts on like getting other people to be able to view what you know the wearer's wearing, or if they all look at the same thing, or like I don't know. It just seems like super one player. Yeah. And like that is definitely has an application, but it seems like there's really nothing for 
Yeah, I, mean, I think the, the answer is pretty obvious that it needs to be social, it needs to be interconnected. That's inevitably coming to all the platforms. Um, it's just a matter of when. Um, I think you, it could be two people in VR experiencing the same thing, or one person in VR and other people in their phone or in you know in, in their TVs experiencing what that person is experiencing. So it could be asynchronous, it could be at the same time. There, there's many opportunities. We just got to remember that this just came out in March. <laughs> So, um, I want to add. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, kind of hard to say this question. Is there any plans to do any type of eye tracking to kind of connect where the user is actually seen in relation to what's obstructing their view? So, for instance, if I'm looking at that screen, everything on my peripheral is going to be more in a blur. So, and how would I like, have you have you guys thought about that into dealing with motion sickness? I hope they're planning to do that. I think that would be really cool. Uh, uh, yeah, as you clarify, I don't work on Oculus. I work on a VR team at Facebook. So, in terms of hardware, we are we are beholden by what they can do and how fast they can do it. Um, how much inspiration do you get from? There's been a lot of sci-fi authors who. Yeah. Done stuff in Ernest Cline, uh, Ready Player One, uh, Dana, who played their demon, sorry. Like, do you get inspiration or feedback, or is it kind of too far out there to be useful? I think it's, it's surprising how much people actually, the people that are actually making these products are being influenced by the sci fi. Yeah. Um, I, haven't, <coughs> I haven't read all of Ready Player One, but I, I don't like that book very much. Uh, I, I think it's. Uh, Fairly cynical and dystopian uh, version of, of the future that, that I think uh, I wouldn't be very excited if that's where we end up. Um, but there, there's definitely you know uh, nuggets of insight we can get from like Minority Report or all these like sci-fi like we've had like set, like decades of training with all these sci-fi movies like even The Matrix or all these things. Unfortunately, they're all pretty dystopian. But um, but there, there there are concepts that are definitely in, in the zeitgeist, um, and they they do influence the way we think about it. What is it you guys are doing? Or can you tell us more about how you're user testing your ideas? Um, whether that's what software. Just I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, that that's uh, I mean that's pretty pretty standard. We at Facebook we have a, a user testing lab where we bring people in and we try ideas with. You know, people, people non Facebook employees, like real humans. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so we, we do that with all of our products, and there's no, no difference in VR. Hey, um, thanks for sharing this awesome stuff. I wonder, I'm curious if you have done much AR stuff or things like HoloLens, and like if you feel like there's those design rules are different in. Where you're not completely immersed, you still see your surroundings, and um, yeah, if, there, if you notice or have seen any differences in like how you might apply things in that space. Yeah, um, a lot of people on our team have an AR background. I'm not one of them, uh, but I think AR is a few years ahead. The technology is not there yet. You know, we were really blessed, um, and. Uh, what, what, so it's, it's not at a point where we can actually think of it as a viable option for the next maybe five to 10 years. Um, but we are seeing people use mixed reality, which is in VR, they can, that you can scan your environment and put that into your, your world. Uh, and that, that can become really exciting. Uh, so so we're, we're playing with concepts like that. We're, we're trying to understand what, you know, that, that makes the environment implicit. <coughs> Then you're just enhancing what we're, that's already around. Do you have any thoughts then on like, like the tools you need to have, like, like Hololens and stuff is more like you're using your gestures and like you, you don't have to hold on to anything. Like any thoughts on like, I mean, in our real world we have other tools we use, right? Like camera or whatever. But right. like, like being able to extend the things you can already do with your own body. Yeah, that I mean that's. That's the dream, right? Be able to, to interact with a virtual world without any input device, uh, other than your own hands. And that, it's very far. 
however, we, there, there's been some progress simulating that stuff. Like, like one of the things is uh, collision detection is really hard in VR, right? If you can't actually grab things. But you can simulate that with, uh, you know, sort of particle effects and having a sound effect and kind of tricking your brain into actually touching something. Uh, so, so you can get around those limitations for now. Um, but I think it's a matter of time where we can do that like, in, in a really immersive way. Maybe the next decade. I have a question, kind of like, what do you guys work on at Facebook in terms of VR? Like, like iLabs working on like a lot of like uh, film and like new ways to experience movies, which to me is like the most interesting part of VR. But what are you guys working on at Facebook? So, <laughs> Facebook is pretty good at distribution. We uh, we we uh, we can take the experiences like ILM uh, and and all those things that are coming out and figure out how to consume them in your phone, how to transition from your phone to your headset, um, how to enable people to create those experiences. Like right now we see like Star Wars and, and you know big content producers are the ones that like, contribute to that. Like how can every everyday real humans actually do that? Um, and the other thing that we're pretty good at is social. Uh, so we are thinking like how do you create a social experience in VR? So you know where your kids can both be in a VR world and and interact with each other. So um, with Facebook, everyone's feed is dense with media. And if you see someone browsing Facebook on their phone, they're scrolling through super quickly. Um, I was wondering what kind of thought is going into the media browsing experience um, in a VR context. Yeah, it's super interesting. Um, it's a shift in, in behavior. Because VR, it's only interesting once you interact with it. So you can't really be passive and enjoy VR. Um, so we're having to intercept people's passive behavior and convert it to something more active, more interactive. Um, so that, that's why it's important to show the value of those experiences, because it, it, it's at a high cost, right? You have, you have to get up from your, from your couch or, or do something like that. Um, so, so it's definitely a change in, in behavior, but we think that the reward is a lot bigger. And like I said, you get more uh, <coughs> attached to the content you're experiencing, and that you have a bigger bond, a bigger connection with it. Um, so I'm hopeful that that's where where entertainment and media will go. Um, you said something earlier, which you mentioned the, the depression story that I had never thought about, which is harassment in VR. I've definitely thought about, oh, it'd be so much fun if I could have a buddy in tilt depression. We can paint things together. That would be amazing. Or about the immersiveness and the yeah. things and all the positive and pleasurable experiences that one can have in that context. I never thought about how visceral and terrifying it would be if someone were choosing to try and, you know, bother you and really get into your head in that context. Is that something you thought about? Do you have any insight? I feel like it's good also just to talk about it. These are people who could potentially affect that in the future, and we all have a product stuff. We forget about harassment until way later. So, big impact. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm personally really, uh, like that, that's really interesting to me. Um, there was a talk at GDC this year by somebody, I forget his name, uh, if you probably Google GDC, VR RS, and you can find it, about how they experimented with, with some of that, those concepts. Um, one of the most disturbing things is that there is no collision detection. So somebody could, you know, you have hands in this world, you could stick your hand through your body. Uh, so you can imagine how that can be very traumatizing, especially with strangers. <laughs> um, so, so I think that's why it's important to like talk about it now and think about ways in which that could be solved. One, one way he suggested, I'm not taking credit for, is that as you get closer, as a stranger gets closer to you, there's like a like a safe space where they disappear. So, so they, so maybe you can define that safe space as a user, uh, and maybe only your friends can step into that safe space, but. We need to set up the, the guardrails for those kinds of experiences to, to prevent that kind of traumatizing event. Because it's it's in theory, like in theory, uh, it doesn't sound as bad. But like think about <coughs> walking, like uh, looking at a picture of vomit. You're like, okay, that's gross. But walking around the street and seeing vomit, like you have a visual visceral reaction against that. So imagine that like 10x with tra strangers in the space. That's uh, that's that's the kind of stuff that is really we need to think seriously about. Uh, 
so far, PR's been like really focused on like a visual input, and I know like you know there's there's still a lot of work to be done on the controller aspect, but that seems to be more about like controlling your visual experience. Do you know much about, or could you speak much to about like what's going on on the hardware side potentially? I know it's not really your your uh, connection to it so much, but. Is there much happening in VR space in terms of like actually interfacing with you through touch, like trying to simulate feelings? Like, uh, you know, if you touch an object, you actually can get some kind of response to your hand. I mean, perhaps the controllers have some kind of like, you know, haptic feedback type thing or something like that. But I was wondering if you had any insight on that. Yeah, they do. Uh, so the Vive is already out and that its controllers have haptic feedback. They have a, a game where you're just shooting out of the boat. And you know, you typically just grab a, an arrow and just call it this. And that is incredible. Like through the haptic feedback, the sound effects, the visuals of it, like you feel that like you're actually pulling a bow and you feel the resistance. Um, and it's like the subtlety of all of those things combined can actually simulate that without without needing that actual space and uh, actual object in space. So so I, there's definitely stuff being being done today and, and got this combination of visuals, audio have the feedback that can simulate touch. I'm curious if they ever bring smell. That's what it's going to be with like movies. Like, oh god, they go to the smell that, but I don't know. Five feet. Okay, I have one last question for you. Um, are there any communities or resources like Slack groups or things to start to get engaged in just whether it's sitting on sidelines just listening to actually getting involved with it? Yeah, totally. Um, so VR today is like designed for the web in the 90s, right? So you gotta go deep <laughs> in the rabbit hole of Reddit or um, like Unity is, is an awesome resource, a free tool, and it's got a huge community of really outspoken people that, that are all so trying to solve the same problems. Um, there, you know, Unity's been out for a while, so they have it's pretty robust the community there. Uh, so that's really where I spend most of my time. Um, there's tons of, a bunch of plugins that were built for Unity, and that is its own uh, rabbit hole. Uh, but yeah, that's that's kind of the the, the workflow. Google stuff, and then go into some sort of forum. All right, thanks, Gabriel.